Good evening, Bill. Good evening, Sandy. How are you today? No. <laughs> The gift. What is the gift? Well, is art the gift? Is art to the viewer or to the artist? Take that question whichever way you want. Is okay. art a gift? You know, the, the people always point out about saving civilizations and all this kind of stuff when war happens and people like to point out that really the only thing you're saving when you're saving a civilization ultimately is the art because, mm -hmm. you know, culture is the only thing that defines a civilization in a lot of ways. Um, so, you know, it could go either way. I see it as a, I see it as a gift to the maker even more than the viewer. Why? Because I am a maker who really wouldn't bother with anything else in life if I couldn't make stuff. I'd be very sad. Mm. Do you think you're separate from the work you make? Um, not as separate as I should be. Wait, hang on. Very interesting already, the kind of the differences I'm feeling with this. You feel you ought to be separate from the work you make? <clears throat> I think you I think it would be better for my mental state if I was more separate from the work that I make. Is the work you make a manifestation of everything you are? Um, I think it might be for some artists. I don't think that you're gonna yell at me for this. Um, I have never yelled I'm, at you, Bill. Uh, uh, <laughs> on air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, I don't think I am. I honestly think that I'm a hack artist. Like I just kind of throw stuff together and I like the way it looks. I don't take it that seriously. I take it very personally, but I don't take it that seriously. Um, I don't so, believe you, sorry. You don't follow? I don't believe you. <clears throat> oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't think that I have that much intention when I'm making stuff. Mm -hmm. I think I should have more. I'm a good mimic. So where'd you find this? Why, well, you know. That I went a couple of weekends ago to London uh, yeah. to see the Burnt City, which is an immersive theatre uh, extravaganza by Punch Drunk, the English theatre company founded by Felix Barrett in the year 2000. And it brought up lots of questions for me about art. What is art and what kind of gift is art to me? And it also made me wonder about the line of separation between where art and truth are or illusion and desire, lots of things intersecting and colliding through being present in within the burnt city uh, for those people who don't know um burnt city it's at woolwich arsenal in london at the moment it's running through to december this year 2022 um immersive theater is theater in which you often promenade rather than sit in seats where you sometimes might interact with performers where the membrane between participation and observation is kind of porous mm -hmm. um, and in the case of this particular production where we are privy to the unfoldment of the last days of Troy um, it takes a long time to fully experience I think what is on offer 
what was fascinating for me is that I did not see or encounter the same things that my friend who I went with saw or encountered. So we arrived together, we went through the door together, but within the first 10 minutes, we had completely- Very different experiences. We'd completely yeah. forgotten about each other. Yeah. And I seem to have followed rather the kind of narrative story side of the unfolding spectacle. Whereas uh, they had very much participated in the more kind of, um, I don't want to say fragmented because that sounds maybe negative, but mm -hmm. a, a much more um, kind of personally inquisitive looking at objects within the, the wider set, for example, which is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I mean, the construction of it is absolutely ast astounding that a, a, a team of people have somehow risen a, a whole world really within this it's a three building complex across which there are different levels and different rooms and lots of different areas for the audience to explore. Do you think that I now I haven't been to any of these. The big one in New York that everyone goes to is that Sleep No More that I've never been yeah. to, but I know people who have been multiple times. Um, primarily because they will have a different experience each time, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. And to like sort of understand the whole thing, you just have to keep going, which yeah. is a neat little trick, by the way, for ticket sales. <laughs> um, but it, it, it feels like it is deep, but I can't imagine that it is anything more than an illusion of depth it, for the viewer. Well, you know what I mean? Very interestingly, I was speaking to a very bright and interesting person last week. And she- <laughs> Not me. <laughs> not you. Uh, she explained that when she saw this, um, she wasn't moved at all. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas I wept, I cried. Um, and this is coming back to the title, The Gift. Um, I want to really look at whether it's something that is deeply personal, whether we feel as if we are actually not just connected to art, but that we are the art. And for, for me, or maybe someone like me, being in a, in a setting like an immersive theater experience is entirely what I actually love because I believe it. I'm in it, I live it. And the that separation is like, it just evaporates. I, I did not feel as if I was entirely separate from what was unfolding in front of me. I, I, didn't, I didn't believe in anything other than what I was seeing. And because I was through the, the process of kind of immersion into the set, I didn't think of myself as being other. I thought of myself as being almost um, invisible. It's very, very strange. I mean, I've written things down here that, you know, when we are, let's say in a, in a different setting, in a gallery setting, and we approach a, a work on the wall, whatever it is, a painting or a photograph, do we at that point see ourselves as separate entities to the art we are consuming or in the looking are we being what is there do you see what uh, i mean that's quite subtle, yeah. isn't it? yeah um you know th there was a there was a musical on broadway 15 years ago called spring awakening i don't know if you've ever heard of it um it you know won a bunch of tony awards and and it was uh um it's 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 a all the characters are 19th century german children but they're all singing rock songs right. um so it's all about sex and suicide and abortions that go bad and and parents that don't understand and it takes the view of all of these kids in 19th century Germany and it like sits on top of it like modern teenage whatever anyway the reason I bring it up is that I saw it three or four times 
um, because my sister and I, my sister used to live in town and I kind of got obsessed with it for a while. But one of the things about it was that there were a certain number of seats that were on the stage, um, uh, like up on the stage at the theater. And there were plants, people who would go sit with you, mm. uh, who you're just sitting next to somebody. And then all of a sudden you look and they stand up and they start singing because they're actually part of the show. You know what I mean? It's like this weird thing that you didn't even realize that that person was, was part of the show. Mm. It's interesting to me because ultimately, yes, in that situation, you feel like you're inside of the thing in some way. Mm. But at the same time, if you tried to interrupt that person, they would totally ignore you which is probably true of, of, of the, of the burnt city stuff yep. mm -hmm. um, where it's almost like you're inside of a video game or something, you know, like you're a non-player character inside of a video game, like, or, or the other way around, like they're doing their thing. But I and think even though there's, I, I noticed this with some people, you know, it's like picking a scab. I was so much caught up in being. Yeah. It didn't feel the need to impress myself upon it. Right, because it was it was immersive enough that you could sort of ignore it. In that, I think there are some people who stay with separation from the gift. Wait, wait, wait. Given. You wait, mean no, hang they on. They choose that? I'm going to explain. Okay. So somebody arrives at, you know, Woolwich Arsenal and they think to themselves, this theater stuff, you know, I know about theater. And I don't perhaps mean that they consciously say that they're gonna cause some kind of mischief, but that they're gonna test the tolerance of sure. what's there, right? To me, I'm not interested in testing a tolerance at all. I'm interested in being somewhere and living it. If that's the gift to me, and I understand that from what I know about Punch Drunk and from what I understand about immersive theater, I don't need to test whether it's real or not. I know it's not real. So you're I, there to surrender yourself to that experience. I can give myself, in that sense, I'm the gift. <laughs> I yeah. can give myself to that experience without having to be hampered by a sense that I need to, you know, somehow disprove it. I, that's that. That seems crazy to me. Like, why would people be there trying to disprove that it's illusory? I think that some people find. And I don't know that I, I wouldn't be on this side of things, would find the idea of sort of surrendering into a situation they don't control as something that made them feel uncomfortable. Then why go to it? Yeah, no, I, I, I understand. I just, and that's part of the reason why I haven't gone to these things is because I don't know that I would enjoy the experience. But it strikes me very much that, you know, we talked about the Oliver Eliasson uh, weather project and you did say that you would go to the back wall and look at the mechanism sure like, yeah 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 you know, <laughs> i was just lying yes. on the floor enjoying the spectacle and but, it, but that but in that case there is not literally a man behind the curtain that i'm going to look at and he'll go you know where i think in the theater experience it's a it's the middle of a performance you know anyway I just want, I, although, you know what? I would find it as fascinating to go backstage at the show that you saw and talk to all of them about how it's done than I would actually experiencing it. Well, well of course, that would be fascinating. Yeah. But, but if I had to choose one or the other, I would choose the backstage rather than the front of house. I wonder about how we allow ourselves to be with magic. Like the magic is a gift. You know, as a kid, or oh, forget being a kid, even now, someone yeah. does a magic trick in front of me. And I would just be amazed. I don't care how they've done it. See, so, yeah. Because I, no, does knowing how they're doing it get rid of the magic for you? Yeah. Does it subvert the magic? It's not the point of it for me. Okay. So when I think about being separate or not from work, I didn't feel myself as separate, even though curiously enough in, 
in these productions, one has to wear a mask, right? So you're separate from the performer. You can't be confused with a performer at any time. Right. Um, so we had almost like Black Death kind of masks on. They were very grotesque, actually. Um, and we walked around wearing them. So you have a sea of masked faces. You're identityless. You give up your identity. Now, for me also, that's hugely freeing. It meant that I wanted to get close and look at something that I would otherwise be too self-conscious to get close to. That I was in there. I was up front. I was in the center. Somebody wants to smear themselves in entrails and have sex on a table. I'm with them. You know, if somebody wants to strip off and I have to stand next to them naked in a shower, I'm going to be doing it. Yeah. I, I really felt like I gave up myself and made myself available to just be in the magic of it, to be in the illusion. And that's a gift. But, but, but in the illusion, but also entirely safe. Yes, of course. Yeah. That's because to start with, one has to know what one is going into in as much as, um, you know, reading the blurb when I got the tickets, which was just a happy accident, really, that I got tickets and didn't have to wait months and months to go and see this. Um, right. There are lots of disclaimers about, you know, there are triggers in this show. There's scenes of nudity, sure. violence, death, sex. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah. and it was really sexy um yeah. but there were things in it that were, were much more subtle than the grand plan showy stuff that was actually hugely triggering there were moments when I felt quite claustrophobic or um intensely agitated uh and I understood them in myself and it was like a, a recollection of the fact that I am I am still myself somehow, even though I had suspended it in order to participate in this illusion. Um, yeah. All of that to me is fascinating to reflect upon or better yet to actually have the kind of wherewithal, the capacity to watch my thoughts in that moment and see what's actually happening. Yeah. I, and I don't know, again, if we think about a painting on a wall, are we watching our thoughts to inquire about whether we are in actual fact the experience of the painting or if we are separate? Well, the painting doesn't do anything if no one's looking at it. I sometimes I wonder if you sit there and you you're 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 at some place and you're looking at some famous painting, you're looking at Starry Night, and there's 15 people looking at it. You almost want to be able to pop inside each person's head and wonder how intensely or intently are they even experiencing having this experience? Is it just a cursory like, oh, that looks like the postcard that I got when I was whatever. Or are there some people who are just like, I've waited my entire life to be standing in front of this painting. Or I know what Van Gogh felt like when he painted this because here I can see his brush strokes or whatever. Like sometimes I wonder because in that range of experiences, I don't know, it tells you more about the viewer than it does about the art, you know, in some ways. But this is my question. I think, uh, I'm not sure if it's, I can't imagine that it's that you don't understand what I'm actually talking about. I'm talking about this very subtle thing that happens when, yeah. when we engage with art, whether it's performative or still it's a moving image, it's a sculpture, whatever it is. Do we understand ourselves in a moment of engagement better yet do we take away our thoughts even though we watch our thoughts to actually be the art because yes, but I, I what i'm saying is that i don't i wonder if so much of that comes down to whether or not that person is even self-aware enough to even have that thought because what you're talking about is a conscious. No, no. The watching of the thought is, is perhaps conscious, right? Okay. What I'm talking about, though, is, is, is the sense that we can not choose to switch off our consciousness, 
but it's sometimes spontaneously, almost like an insight. It kind of comes up and we're there. We are the moment. I think that you you would like everyone to have that level of experience to art, but I doubt that many people do. Is this just because nobody asks about it? Is this just because nobody really, I mean, cares about it? No, I think that I think that that I think that the experience you're talking about is the fantasy of all artists. That 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 people fantasy of artists or reality of artists. Fantasy fantasy of artists. I'm sure it happens to some people, but I think that the the percentage of people who actually experience music or theater or paintings or whatever photo, photographs at the level at which we want or think or desire them to is actually excruciatingly small and disappointing. And so we tell ourselves stories to make ourselves feel self-important. Oh, we're back to telling ourselves stories. Of course we are. Everyone's always telling themselves stories. Oh, that's so bright. Excuse me a minute. Wow. <laughs> Just a bit blue mile. You sure lit up then because before you were very dark. <laughs> okay. Masks. Masks. <sighs> Freaky masks. Freaky mask. Well, Gillian Waring, celebrated British artist, contemporary artist working now. It always comes down to the Brits. Go yeah. ahead. And a woman. Oh, God. Pardon for offend. Um, really fascinating body of work in which, I mean, in the early work, we see somebody who approached strangers in the street and got them to write signs about what they were really feeling. And the title of the work was signs that say what you want them to say, not signs that say what you don't want. To say. I can't remember a very long title, very okay. clever photographs of, you know, a businessman holding up a sign that says I'm desperate mm -hmm. or, um, you know, some kind of existential statement from, someone who looks quite nerdy or so on this documentation mm -hmm. of people's own kind of separation from the true gift of, of maybe who they really are and that they might not perhaps look like the statement they've made and I suppose I find in Waring's work as she gets into her more uh, mature stride into the late 90s and early noughties we're seeing someone who's using especially prosthetic masks in in photographs to become her own archetype and so there's a collapsing of the distance between the experiencer and the experience there's a total dis dissolving of um it's an anti cindy sherman <laughs> kind of i mean people think that this work is in the same ballpark as sherman mm. but it's doing something that's totally different to me, as far as I'm concerned, like Sherman is giving us alternative, wearing is bringing us almost into, into the, the realm of double whammy truth through illusion. Do, do you think that most viewers of art are thinking anything beyond the primary aesthetic? No, don't forget, I spend all day long talking to young people yeah. about, about art in a way that is the absolute opposite, really, to just taking it on face value. <laughs> sure, but you have to, I, I assume that you probably need to prompt them, push them in order to get answers out of them. I do, but don't forget, I'm doing that through a process of age 11 to 19. And so there maybe there's a false expectation on my part that by the time people get to be adults, everyone's doing this. Well, maybe I accept, maybe they're not. But um, I'm not discounting it. I'm just I'm just asking. What are you asking? I'm wondering if most people appreciate the gift. Do you know, I, I maybe I'm just completely stupid. 
Yeah. But I think actually most people do do have some understanding that there is a gift for us in art. Yeah. I don't think everybody understands what the art's grand plan might be based on what the artist might have thought of as an intention. But I think for most humans, there is a sense, at least there's an ability that we can engage with what we think of as visual art, but it could be performance, it could be music on a very deep level. I mean, I don't think you could tell me now that you honestly think people aren't moved by music. Uh, I think that there are a lot of people who are moved by music, but I think that there are a billion people in the world. And I think that maybe 7 billion of them have never felt that way about music. That doesn't mean that they wouldn't, were they to hear the music of their life? Maybe. I mean, listen, I, it, I don't, I'm not saying that I don't, I want to get on your, I want to get on your cart and ride with you, but I'm, really? but I'm a cynic and a nihilist and oh, no. I have had way too much experience in the world. Um, I mean, I'm not an inexperienced idiot, Bill, living in some. No, 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 no. But like, but you, you still have faith. You, 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 you have a belief <sighs> I don't know I even I even look it's funny because you said something there about uh artists and their intentions and you know in my experience most artists intentions come after the fact not before they, they come up with justifications for the work they make. It is not a, uh, a mission statement that then gets built. Um, and again, I, it's like, I, I, I may be, but, but at the same time, it's like, I don't think that, that taking all of that out of it, mm. I don't think that there can't be you know, religious experiences in experiencing art. I, I, it's not to say that I don't think that those moments when people do connect with something somebody else created isn't the best that we have to offer. Because it is. I just think that it's far more rare than you. Also, people, I mean, you how much how much well you and i or any of us um disagree about which art moves us right but that's you and i have that conversation all the time that's not the point of it the the, the point would be more that i you we encounter something in our lives that we might class as art for one reason or another and that not just that we observe it, not just that we engage with it, but that the zone between what might be perceived between us and it falls away. Collapses, yeah. And that gift of total communion is available to all of us. And I, I do think that in a lot of cases there are people who are not educated about art, people who are otherwise what you might sure. be not very bright even, who are experiencing, uh, even experiencing is a very tricky word because experience implies some kind of... You could argue that the more knowledgeable somebody is about that stuff, the less likely they are because you know what? S you know, submitting to all of that is actually a very scary experience. But maybe that's the folly of our times is that we're such control freaks. Sure. You are such a control freak. That... <laughs> Remember when you said you weren't going to yell at me? It's not yelling. I was very quiet. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I, I'm, 
as I've said already, very interested in that space or non-space or whatever it is that occurs sure. when there is this true communion um, and that the universal nature of all the things we might ever talk about, that we all feel at some point in some way, whether that's what we could loosely say is love or sadness, sorrow, or joy or regret, or whatever these things are, they're in the stream of consciousness and that through that engagement, communion with art, whatever it is, we are actually absorbed or reabsorbed into a stream we already occupy. And in so doing, perhaps we step out of a stream. In, into what? Timelessness? Yeah. Don't make fun of me, Bill. I'm not making fun of you. Mm, you're on the edge. <laughs> no, I'm not. Listen, I don't, I don't disagree. I, it's like the experience that you're describing is really, to me, the only bother for being alive. Because it's the same experience you have in a relationship with other people in a lot of ways. No, I don't know if it is. And that's another really interesting thing that comes up in this is that when I encounter you. Yeah. I encounter especially you, me. Especially you. <laughs> I encounter you with all your conditions and limitations, and you encounter me with all my conditions and limitations. Whereas when we are with art, we are kind of in an echo chamber because the reverberation of what's happening is only about me you know there might be legacy or resonance of the art yeah, or there were with our own limitations yes but nonetheless that there's something different boomeranging in the quality of that when there's another human involved that becomes locked down in those limitations and conditions I don't know this. I would have to spend a lot longer thinking about this and we've only got six minutes. Why, so, why the, why this Whistler painting? Well, I was thinking about the gift of, um, feeling, oh, I don't know. It sounds so silly now. I felt when I went to see the burnt city, that it was an extraordinary thing to have done was also very aware that I came out and this is just so silly again I was kind of riven with a sense of regret and the regret what? came from the feeling that I should have been one of those performers oh okay right and sure. that there were lots of things that came up for me about myself when I wasn't engaged with the spectacle or the illusion, when I'd come away from it and I was thinking about what had happened. And I realized that I, I felt a lot of regret about not taking maybe opportunities when I was much younger or ignoring parts of myself that I wasn't brave enough to embrace. Um, or in fact, really coming to terms with my true nature uh, which I don't think I've done in my life until relatively re recently, even though at other times in my life, I may have been brave enough to call myself an artist or a writer. Mm -hmm. at other times in my life, I've been conceited enough to call myself an artist or a writer. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm also aware that I've not yet fulfilled a potential in me and in part that was to do with dance and performance sorry my dishwasher is going but the reason why I picked Millie Finch is <laughs> I love this painting and you identify with that woman because I identify with Millie Finch I identify with the painting 
one, I love the painting full stop and that is the lazy looking version of it. I just like the look of it, but also- Just liking the look of it, by the way, is not lazy, but go ahead. In context of the other things, yes, I Got it, go ahead. Uh, Anyway, it's also because Millie Finch was the stand-in. She was always the stand-in. So Maud Franklin was Whistler's model mostly and his lover, his mistress for many years. Millie Finch, who I suspect Whistler probably did also have some kind of sexual relationship with, was still just always like a bit of the poor man's Maud Franklin. And there's always been something about that that struck a chord with me. And so I was thinking about to really identify with something is both dangerous, but also perfect. Because I can look at this painting and I smile as much as I might cry. That in itself is a, is a kind of gift to me, no? That I'm it is. raised up yeah. inside me, something is, something is stirred. Do you, do you think that you look externally for definition of yourself more than you look internally? No, <laughs> I don't. I think I do look externally. I think that that's devastating for me, looking externally. And I know I do it all the time, but I am looking internally. I wonder which things we identify with and why, what, yeah. what that shows us. But that in itself, again, is this extraordinary power of art that, that I can look at a Millie Finch painting by Whistler and I know that I see myself. I see myself. I mean, I see myself, as you know, in every Francesca Woodman image, I see myself in, yes. you know, I, I just do. It's, it, uh, Make of me what you will. Anybody judging me now, fine. Yeah. But I also know now that I know more about Whistler and art history and Millie Finch really speaks to me. Well, I feel like you you externalize your concept of self in order to uh, sublimate knowledge. Like in order to understand something, you identify with it. We've got less than a minute, Bill. I know, but I think I think that that is it. Maybe we should talk about that. Let's talk about identity next week. Fine. Okay. Anyway, the gift of art. What is it? It's a uh, uh, quick. Ah. <laughs> um. We don't know after all this time. Anybody no. watching? We have no. Clue. I think I think it's in the eye of the beholder. Honestly. Oh, what a cop-out answer. (laughs) Bye, Bill. Bye, Sandy.